the binder which I hold in my hand contains the names of every person present this morning. Steve, Barry, Francis, Allison, Abigail, David, Sarah, Matt, Caroline, Julia, Dee, Rob, John. Your names are all there. And they're there not only in order that we might be in step with COVID-19 related protocols, but they are there to bear testimony that the message spoken from this pulpit today has been heard by you. There's a similar list recorded in Nehemiah chapter 12. It's a list of all of the priests and all of the Levites who were serving in Jerusalem during the period of time in which Nehemiah, their governor, had taken a leave of absence and had gone away to Babylon. It was during this period of time that Malachi the prophet came as the messenger of the Lord to speak not only to the priest and the Levites, but also to all of those people that they influenced for good or ill there in that city and in the nation as a whole. He comes to them this morning not with a message of encouragement, but rather with a message of challenge. He comes to confront them with the reality that they are not even giving him the same honor that they would give their earthly fathers. That they are not even giving him the same fear, and by fear we mean here reverence, that they would give their earthly masters and that they were not even giving uh, their God the same obedience that they would give their earthly governors. If I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? If I am more than a governor, if I am a great king, where is my obedience? This was the sin of the priest and Levites. Now they had their reasons, and those reasons may have seemed very credible to them. But in the end, they were rationalizations, not justifications. They were excuses, not valid reasons. The problem was, in a nutshell, their God was too small. They were forgetting the fact that he was greater than earthly fathers. He was a heavenly father. 
Uh, they were forgetting that he was greater than earthly masters, that, that he is the, the master of all. They were forgetting that he was a greater than a governor, that he was a great king. And all of this is summed up in his name. It says that they were despising his name. And the name that's given to him in these few verses that we've read today is the Lord of hosts. That name is, is used no less than 11 times in these verses. In fact, verse for verse, the name Lord of hosts is used more in this passage than in any other passage in the entire Word of God. He is the Lord of hosts. This is a name which indicates that he is uh, the ruler among all the armies of heaven and that he is the ruler over all the inhabitants of the earth. This is to say that he is the Lord of hosts. Sometimes that means uh, the, the, the stars. Uh, sometimes, other times, I believe in this instance, it means uh, the angels. And it's saying that he here is the Lord of the angelic host. He is the Lord, as it were, of the armies of heaven. And he says, you actually show greater respect for your fathers and greater respect for your masters and greater respect for your governors than you show for my name. And he actually uses a very strong word. It's a very strong indictment. He says, you despise my name. Now, despise here does not mean hate. I mean, on occasion, perhaps someone uh, in the heat of the moment, uh, someone in a moment of great anger will say, I despise her, or I despise him. And it, it's used there almost uh, as a synonym for hatred. But to despise is not to hate. To despise is actually to undervalue. A New Testament equivalent is used by Paul when he wrote to Timothy and said to Timothy, do not let anyone despise you because of your youthfulness. That is, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. Do not let anyone undervalue you because you have not yet reached a certain age. But here, these people who valued their fathers and who valued their masters and valued their governors had undervalued their God. Their God was too small. Their God who inhabited uh, uh, the, the heavens and the earth was in their thinking someone who was not even worthy of the same honor, the same reverence, and the same obedience as their earthly fathers, masters, and governors. And it's the leaders I'm talking about. From Eliashib, the high priest, on down through all the named priests of Nehemiah 12, and the named Levites of uh, of Nehemiah uh, 12, uh, all of them, they despised his name. They undervalued God. They deprived God of the honor and of the reverence and of the obedience that he deserved. And God had cursed their blessings. As a result, perhaps quite often misunderstood, it's used both in Nehemiah, the very expression, as well as in Malachi, uh, cursed their blessings. This doesn't mean 
that the blessings that had been given to them as priests and Levites had been cursed. No, it means that their blessings that they had given to the people and that God ostensibly had given through them to the people that their blessings were cursed. The fact that the spiritual leaders of the people didn't have the honor for God, the reverence for God, and the obedience to God that they ought to have has cursed their blessings, it has affected their ministry. And so it's not a matter of just saying, oh, well, you know, the, the, the leaders were, were not exactly doing uh, what they ought to do and they didn't really have the attitude that they ought to have and it, it, was, it was really quite uh, unfortunate but it really didn't have an effect uh, on the people. No, it says that the people are downstream from all of this. And they are drinking the water uh, that has been polluted by the fact that their spiritual leaders did not honor God, reverence God, and obey God as they ought. So we approach a passage like the passage today, I think with understandable fear and trembling. It's interesting to me, that the passage that was directed to the people as a whole, namely verses 2 to 5, the people who were questioning God's covenantal love, uh, the people to whom God would say, uh, I have sovereignly chosen you and I have providentially cared for you, that this, this sin, as it were, of the people is dispensed with in four short verses. But when you come to the consideration of the sins of the leaders, it's verse after verse after verse after verse after verse. James well said, not many of us should desire to be teachers, knowing that as such we will be subject to greater condemnation. And so the Lord plainly charges his priest with this statement. You have despised my name. I am a father. Where is my honor? I am uh, a, a master. Where is my fear? I am a greater than a governor. I am a great king. Where is my obedience in the Lord says to them, you have despised my name. But how did they respond? How have we despised your name? And it's as if the Lord says, well, if you don't know, I'll tell you. And he gives them two primary answers the first of which is dealt with uh, here in our text, verses uh, 6 to 14 of uh, chapter 1, and the second of which is dealt uh, with in the second part of our text, uh, verse 1 to verse 9 of chapter 2. But the first answer is very simply this. You have polluted the offerings. Did you see that? You have polluted polluted the offerings. Now this is, is quite interesting uh, because the very um, uh, clear uh, teaching of the text is this, verse 11, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. That is the manifest will of of God, that his name will be great among the nations and that uh, incense will be offered to his name and pure offerings. But he is clear that the priest have polluted the offerings. That's why he says uh, very uh, clearly, verse 7, 
How have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, this is, uh, the, the term we use today is doubling down. Rather than saying, hands up, you're right. Uh, they, they double down. They dig their heels in. And they say, uh, uh, we, we, we don't know what you're talking about. How have we polluted you? And he says, well, if, if you don't know how you've polluted me, if you don't know how you've polluted my uh, offerings, let me explain. Here's the first way. You have polluted the offerings by the animals that you have brought to the table. Now, twice in this passage, you see the expression, the Lord's table. Now, for those of us who are, are, are living in this day and time, when we speak of the Lord's table, uh, we normally think about when we observe uh, the Lord's Supper and we come together to the Lord's table and we share the bread and the wine together and that's the, the Lord's table. Now in this passage, uh, Malachi is going to use the expression the Lord's table twice, but he's not referring uh, to the communion table. He's not referring uh, to the Lord's Supper, but he's talking about the table in the temple compound upon which the sacrifices of animals were made. At one time in the history of Israel, each individual would sacrifice their own animal on the Lord's table. Uh, by this time uh, in Israel's history, uh, this uh, task has been uh, delegated to uh, the priest, and they are the ones uh, who are at the Lord's table uh, offering sacrifices. And he says, you have polluted the offerings by the animals that you have brought to the table. Now, don't take my word uh, for it. I wasn't there. Uh, but Malachi's writing as an eyewitness, and here is what Malachi says. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? You can read further in verse 13. You bring what has been taken by violence or what is lame or sick, and this is your offering. He says in verse 14, Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. And he concludes with these words, For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Yet he says, you have polluted the altar by offering these polluted offerings, these animals that you have brought to the table. It's shameful. Some of them are blind. All of them are blemished in some way. You are meant to be bringing your best. And in reality, you are bringing the very least that you can give and still have some sense that you're doing what you are meant to be doing. And he says, I bear witness against you. I'm displeased by this. I take no pleasure in you because I am dishonored by this. I am a father, where is my honor? I am a master, where is my fear? I am a great king, where is my obedience? You have polluted the offerings by the animals that you have brought to the table. But not only that. You have polluted the offerings by the attitudes you have brought to the table. 
And, and, and you see, the, the bringing of these blind and blemished animals was, was an external action which can be observed. But the bringing of these blind and blemished animals reflected something of an internal attitude which could be discerned from what the people, namely in this instance the priest, were offering. It's very sad. Very sad indeed. Listen to what he says, maybe in verse 12. But you profane it, that is, uh, the, the thrice holy name of the Lord of hosts, you profane his name. When you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, listen to this, it's in quotation marks, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it. Now, that's, that's not a, a, an, an idiom or a colloquialism with which uh, we, we are familiar with. Uh, snort at it. It is the nearest equivalent, I'm told, uh, in, in English would be sort of you turn up your nose. You know that? So you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, you turn up your nose at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring that which taken by violence or lame or sick, and, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand? You see, the underlying attitude is that the priest have grown weary not only in well-doing, but they've actually grown weary of well-doing. And so here we are again. It's a Sunday. Be sure to sanitize your hands. Oh, your mask isn't on properly. Sit over there, please. Don't mingle. You mustn't sing. Leave quickly after the service. I'm so weary of this. I'm so weary of this. I'm so tired of this. To which our God says, I am a great God, worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. I am a great God who will be honored, who will be reverenced, and who will be obeyed. You have to be socially distanced from one another, those who actually know who I am, shrink back from me in fear. You have to have your faces covered with a mask. Those who've actually beheld me in all my glory have actually hidden their faces from me. You are unable to sing. Those who've actually caught a glimpse of who I am and of the great awesome power that I possess have been speechless, unable to say or sing a word. And we say, oh, what a weariness this is. It's Sunday, 9, 11, and 4. There's the screen. There's the reading. Here are the people. Here's the sermon. Leave quickly. I'm just weary of it all. you know who I am. I am a father. Where is my honor? I'm a master. 
Where is my reverence? I am a great king. Where is my obedience? The sad thing is, the people's attitudes had been affected by their leaders' attitudes. The leaders were just going through the motions. The leaders were just following the routines and rituals of religion. The leaders were the ones who were drawing near to him with their lips, even whilst their hearts were far from him. And now, like priests, like people, you have despised my name. You've done so by polluting the offering through the animals that you bring to the table. But really, even more so, through the attitudes that you bring to the table. I remind you today, even as I have been reminded in our study of this text this week, he is a great king. He is the Lord of hosts. His name will be feared among the nations. I pray that we will not lose sight of his greatness. That we will not forget that he is the Lord of hosts. And that we would be among those who fear his name. And view him even more highly than we would our earthly father, our earthly masters, or our earthly governors. But not only uh, have you polluted the offerings, but it gives a second reason as well. You have corrupted the covenant. And in uh, verses uh, 1 to 9 of chapter 2, he talks about their corruption of what is called the covenant of Levi. And, and there, there are many ways of approaching these nine verses, but just in the interest of time, uh, I, I, I want to try to sum it up under, under two headings. By breaking the commands of God, the priests and Levites had brought upon themselves and the people dire and disastrous consequences. Let me explain. By breaking the commands of God. Notice he says clearly, verse 1, And now, O priest, this command is for you. And he uses that same word repeatedly throughout the text. This command is for you. And what is the command that was given to the priest? Well, you can find this in verses 1 to 9, or I could perhaps encourage you just by giving you an example. Who's the most famous, or who's the most famous uh, Levite of this particular period of time? The most famous um, a priest, the most famous a Levite of this particular period, period of time was a man by the name of Ezra. And, and there's, a, there's a book in the Bible that uh, uh, is bearing his name. And I was interested this week to sort of uh, lay Ezra alongside Eliashib and just compare them one to the other. Uh, the, the life of Ezra and the life of a priest and Levite summed up in one verse, Ezra 7.10. He had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. You see, he had dealt with his attitude. He had prepared his heart. He had prepared his heart by the realization of who God was and of all that God had done and that he was worthy of honor and reverence and obedience. He had prepared his heart 
uh, to do three things. One, to seek the law of the Lord. And the scripture is very clear that this is the responsibility of the Levite. But not only had he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, but also to do it. And that is that he was responsible not only to to learn the uh, law of God, but to obey the word of God, to keep it in his own life. And not only was he charged with the responsibility of, of learning and obeying, but also teaching the Word of God. Listen to this. My covenant with him, this is chapter 2, verse 5, was one of life and peace that I gave to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and the people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. You see, this is the command that is given to the priest and to the Levites. You're to prepare your hearts. You're to seek my law. You're to obey my law. You are to teach my law. But they had broken his commands. You see this in verse 8. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I will make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you did not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. So by breaking the commands of God, the priest and the Levites bring dire and disastrous consequences upon themselves and others. They bring these consequences upon themselves. He says clearly, verse 9, I will make you, he uses the same word, despised. I will make you despised and abased before all the people. I will cut you down to size is the expression that we might use today. I will cause you to be undervalued. I will cause you to be devalued, abased before all the people. But it brought not only dire and disastrous consequences upon the priest and the Levites, but upon the people as a whole. Listen to this in verse 8. By turning aside from my way, you have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. I've cursed your blessings. I've cursed your blessings. Your ministry has been affected by your attitude. And he says... You are now seeing many people who are stumbling because of your instruction. And so the reality is, he says, you've despised my name. You've despised my name by polluting my my offerings. You've despised my name by corrupting uh, my uh, covenant. I I want to uh, conclude this morning by just saying to you very briefly the very reason that he is charging these priests with violating his covenant is because he does intend to validate this covenant. They have corrupted it, but they have not invalidated it. God says, I will still have someone who will seek my law. I will still have someone who will do it. I will still have someone 
who will teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Let me ask you if these words describe anyone you know. He feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. No wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace. He walked with me in uprightness. He turned many from iniquity. Does that sound to you like Eliashib of the Old Testament? Does that sound to you like Caiaphas of the New Testament? Does it sound to you like the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest? The reason that we no longer have priest, plural, is because we are priest. And the reason that we no longer have an Eliashib or a Caiaphas is that we no longer need a high priest because we have a great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he fits this description completely. So I would simply say to you, dear people, today, please pray for your spiritual leaders. Please pray for those who, though we are not priests, have been given, as Paul would put it in Romans chapter 15, priestly duties. But even as you pray for us, please remember ultimately that you do not look to us, but you look through us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you do not seek to be like us, but you seek to be like Him. And pray that when we fall and fail, that we will have humility and contrition before God, because you would never be benefited by prideful, leaders who do not have contrite spirits before God. But pray that you would never use the limitations, the inadequacies, or even the failures of your leaders as an excuse for not being right toward God and even right in your relationship to them. God is our Father. Where is His honor? He is our Master. Where is His fear? He is our great King. Where is His obedience? The Lord Jesus Christ honored His Father. He obeyed the fifth commandment. The Lord Jesus Christ reverenced His Master doing all of those things that God his Father had given him to do. And he obeyed, according to Philippians 2, he obeyed even to the point of death all that God his Father had given him to do. May we, by his grace, be like him. Amen. Well, our, our final uh, hymn uh, today, Restore, O Lord, the honor of of your name. Let's, let's reflect on these words and rejoice in them as we draw to a close this morning.
I'm going to pray. Uh, before I do, uh, just let me say that when we have prayed, uh, we're really not meant to uh, mingle with one another at this time. So we'll ask you to uh, find the exit fairly quickly. Uh, please go through uh, this door, make use of the gel, and then we trust by God's grace to see you on Tuesday. Uh, do be uh, sure uh, to pray for the meetings uh, at Langdale at half ten and at 11 here at DBC and also at Lane Glade. Let's come to God in prayer. Help us to see who you are. Help us to draw near with reverent fear, knowing that you deserve honor and fear and obedience. Forgive us for letting circumstances be large while viewing you as though you were small, for letting our feelings and emotions be large while we view you as though you were small and seemingly insignificant. Help us today to give you the honor a father deserves, the fear a monster deserves, the obedience a great king deserves. Help us to see who you are and then help us to respond appropriately. Both leader and member alike, help us all. Our names are in the book. We've heard the message. May books yet to be written reveal that we have heeded it. For Christ's sake. Amen.